Fans loved his innocence and authenticity. He was a genuine player. He'd play for fun and to entertain the crowd. And the fans realised that. That was Manny Garincha, the joy of the people. He had a childish spirit. Garincha was football's answer to Charlie Chaplin. In his position, he was the greatest player I've ever seen. It was never a case of a woman being beautiful or ugly for him. Garincha was terrible. He'd sleep with anyone. On a Monday, when he didn't turn up at Botafogo, you could find him playing football in his hometown. And that was Brazil's right winger. Garincha was an alcoholic. There was a time in his life when he was barely playing anymore, and that, yes, he lost his way a little. He lost his way. He started to lose that spark and joy that he'd always had. His eyes that had always shone so brightly began to look sad instead. And unfortunately, we ended up losing one of the greatest players of all time at such a young age. Sweden, 1958. Brazil were due to face the USSR in their final and decisive World Cup group game. The Soviets were pioneers of a new scientific football and feared by the Brazilians. However, the Brazil side contained two young stars who'd been held back from their opening two games, Pelé and Garincha. The world was about to witness three minutes that would change football forever. It was in that game that both of them came in. The selectors had a long talk, Garincha had been training well and Pelé had recovered from an injury. So the two of them started against the USSR and they did something spectacular. Both players made an immediate impact, but Garincha in particular was mesmerising. His close control, dribbling ability and mazy running had the opposition tied in knots. The Soviets went on to lose 2-0. But in those first three minutes, the world had witnessed the emergence of a new power in football. The magnitude of the occasion was lost on Garincha, however. He hadn't even realised Brazil had qualified to the knockout stages and sent the Soviets home. He thought there would be another round of matches. After the game against the Russians, we knocked them out so they were leaving. We were all sat down watching them leave, and Garincha came up to us and said, Who are those big guys? We said, They're the Russians, we beat them yesterday, we knocked them out. He replied, Won't there be a second leg? That gives you some idea of his mentality. He didn't have the same sense of responsibility as your normal national team player would. Even with Brazil, he'd do his thing and play his way. But it was brilliant. And that's what was good and important. That irresponsible streak had initially cost him his place in the starting lineup. But now his dribbling skills were crucial to Brazilian success. Nilton Santos would shout, give the ball to Mané, and Garincha would get the ball, dribble down the wing, and then cut it back for either Vava or Pelé. A lot of the time, you'd get one player here, another there, maybe three players marking him, and he'd dribble past them. He was very explosive. He could go past anyone. For Garincha, the final against the host Sweden was just another game. It could have been one of the kickabouts he regularly enjoyed with friends back in his hometown of Pau Grande. But yet again, he managed to mesmerize the opposition. He'd dribble, get to the byline and cross the ball in. So much so that in the last game against Sweden, he made two identical runs. They resulted in two goals for Vava, who was our main striker. The 5-2 win against Sweden gave Brazil the trophy they'd dreamed of since defeat in the 1950 final. Football had changed forever. For Garincha, life would never be the same again. 
Manuel Francisco dos Santos was born on the 28th of October 1933 in the rural town of Pau Grande, near Rio de Janeiro. No one, not even Pele, contributed so much to the myth of Brazilian football and its identification with the beautiful game. Here was a player who brought joy to the masses with his carefree attitude and blissfully innocent desire to entertain. Yet his own life was blighted by tragedy. Garincha was as brilliant as he was reckless. His story began here, on the rough pothole pitches of his hometown, where he honed his extraordinary dribbling skills. But the young Manuel had an even greater passion in his early years. Oh, he had a great eye for hunting. As soon as we disturbed the birds, he'd bring one down with his first shot. And that's how he got his nickname, Garincha. It was the name of a little bird, a wren, that you still get around here, that he loved to kill. We'd go out hunting and say to him, Garincha, let's not kill any wrens. They don't even give you a meal. But he wouldn't care. He'd still kill them. That Garincha rose to the top of world football is even more remarkable when you consider that he was born with such a disability. Garincha era... Garincha was a physical impossibility. He had one knee that went in and one knee that went out. Normally people have both knees going in or both going out. In theory, he shouldn't have even been able to walk. Despite his physical limitations, Garincha soon became renowned throughout the region for his footballing ability. He was the local team's star player and it wasn't long before he attracted the attention of Rio's big clubs. However, by the time that Botafogo came calling in 1953, he'd already been rejected by a host of clubs and was disillusioned. After the disappointments at San Cristóvão, Fluminense and Vasco, he didn't want to try with anyone else, not even Botafogo. He thought he'd just go down to Rio and people would mock him, calling him a cripple or bendy legs. He'd had enough. When the boy with the bent legs arrived at Botafogo's training ground, he was immediately thrown in against the national team left-back, Nilton Santos. When he had his trial, they all saw him with his strange bent legs, and so got Nilton Santos to mark him. And so training began, and he dribbled past Nilton Santos. So after training, Nilton Santos grabbed hold of Garincha and took him to the president. He told him, Sign this guy here, so I don't have to play against him. At Botafogo, Garincha was a phenomenon. He played with innocence and irresponsibility, with relish and with brilliance. Twist one way, stop the ball, twist the other, and the defender would fall over. He never did tricks to mock his opponents, he did them because that's what came into his head. There was nowhere marking him, no one could stop him. When Mane got the ball, everyone was desperate to see what he would do with it. He was born to play like that, and he was all crooked and bent with those confusing legs, and it probably confused his opponents even more. His ability was drawing comparisons with the other young star of Brazilian football. Garincha and I played together in the national team for around 12 years, from 1958 until Garincha passed away. When Garincha and I played together for Brazil, we never lost a single game. We were unbeaten. <laughs> Not one to take football too seriously, Garincha quickly established himself as the dressing room joker. He had the mentality of a child and not an adult. He was always joking around. He didn't take anything seriously. I remember one time, I was in my team suit with the long trousers and everything, and I was giving an interview. This was in Rio, and I was giving this interview in the press room full of people. And do you know what Manny Garincha did? He came up behind me, pulled my trousers down. I was shocked. I had to pull them up. But that's what he was like. Joker. He was effectively a child in an adult's body, but supporters identified with his desire to entertain. So much so that he transcended the local rivalries between teams in Rio. 
Acho que é, 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 é o único I actually think that Garrincha is the only player who is loved by every single fan from every single club in Brazil. Garrincha doesn't belong to any one club. Everyone in Brazil supported Garrincha. He was the joy of the people. That was the way he played. He even entertained his opposition. It was marvelous. I don't think there'll ever be anyone like him again. I loved Garrincha. I'd support him, even though he played for Botafogo. Because I wanted to see him do those things with the football that he could do. I think we just had to admire his football. And his football was helping Botafogo win titles too. The club had been established the best team in Brazil alongside Santos. And they became even stronger in 1958 when they added a young striking sensation, Amarildo, to their ranks. He saw firsthand why Garincha was regarded as the most amateur footballer professional football had ever produced. Botafogo had Garincha, Didi, Quarantinha, Zagallo, Milton Santos, all regular international players. So I was gobsmacked. For me, this was the biggest club in Brazil, with the biggest players in Brazilian football, with the exception of Pelé. There were games that Garincha wouldn't even know the name of the team were playing. He wouldn't know. When he stepped out onto the pitch, he knew he played for Botafogo, and he knew he had to win, but he wouldn't know who he was playing against. He'd always ask, who are we playing against today? We're playing Vasco. Ah, oh, right. Football was just a bit of fun for him. It wasn't a serious job where he looked to earn a lot of money. What money he did earn, he squandered anyway. With continued success for both club and country, the trappings of fame were inevitable. But Garincha had no interest in becoming a superstar, heading back home whenever the opportunity arose. Although married to childhood sweetheart Nair, the father of eight daughters, Garincha was a notorious womanizer and drinker. He'd go missing from Botafogo for days, only to be found back home in Pau Grande recovering, or with the latest girl to take a shine to him. And he would still play football barefoot with his childhood friends after a training session or even a game. He lived here. He was always here. When he didn't have something going on with Botafogo, then he'd play here. Either up on the little pitch or with Pau Granji. He'd always play with us. He'd leave Rio after a game and go back to Pau Granji, and there would be a kickabout going on, so he played that too. After a game, Garincha and his friends would invariably head to the bar. Garincha was no stranger to drink. His father had been an alcoholic. It obviously ran in the family. We always loved to have a drink. There's a bar over there, and that's where he'd go on his benders. Garincha really liked the beer, or at least a drink or two. He had two great loves in life, beer and chasing women. The man was terrible. Nothing got past him. He could play on Sunday, get drunk on Monday, not train on Tuesday, appear hungover on Wednesday. On Thursday he'd train. On Friday he'd go dancing and enjoy a party. On a Saturday he'd recover in time for Sunday's game where he'd light up the Maracanã. In 1962, Brazil travelled to Chile to defend their World Cup title with largely the same squad as 58. But this time, Pelé, Garincha and their teammates had the weight of the world's expectations on their shoulders.